welcome to episode two where I'm hoping to answer a lot of the questions that you guys have sent me over the years. One big reoccurring question I do receive is, what is it that inspires you? What, where, where do you get your ideas from? And I think it's pretty safe to say that Star Wars, um, Blade Runner are, are major elements of what goes on churning around up here. I will say that growing up in the mid through the late 70s into the 80s, I was able to see so many different avenues of sci-fi and fantasy. And with being able to witness the birth of Star Wars, I was also able to witness the birth of all the bad sci-fi, the, the B-movies. The movies that were basically riding the coattails of Star Wars. And even with Star Wars, you know, the aliens in it were basically just rubber masks. And with the B-movies, that was even more prevalent. And I absolutely love that stuff. I love what I call Halloween mask aliens. It's just basically a dude wearing some dingy clothes and they put a rubber mask over his head. And I love it. Star Trek is a little bit more subtle sometimes where they'll chew up some bubble gum and then stick it on the bridge of their nose and then that ends up becoming an alien, which I love that also. But I, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by bad sci-fi, B-movies. Movies that, um, especially Roger Corman films, and he will make a, he, or he made a movie, and then he will take the chunks of that movie, the, the, the sci-fi battle scenes, and he'll take them and put those spaceships in another movie, and then chop that up, and then it'll show up somewhere else. And uh, I think it's so cool how you can take so many different elements of sci-fi from the robots, from the, the, the spaceships, from the locations, the tech, the, the blasters. And you just change a little bit of piece here and there, um, swap something around, wear it backwards, and um, you have something brand new. It's obvious that it's a ripoff, but I absolutely love it. So sure, bad sci-fi will always be labeled as being a ripoff of something mainstream, Star Wars, Star Trek, whatever it may be. But you can also argue and say that they were heavily inspired by it. That to me is the driving force of taking something that Star Wars, for instance, and filtering it, whittling it down into something else, and then watching what that creation has inspired down the line over the years. And a lot of it has been regurgitated in this. So you have to imagine through the late 70s, and I'm sure many of you possibly have lived through this, there's no internet, so you want more sci-fi, you want more Star Wars. Where do you get it from? Well, when I was a kid, you'd have to go to the library or a bookstore to get more of what you were craving, more of these aliens and, and spaceships, not necessarily just Star Wars, but for me, just to be inspired by and see other avenues, other locations, other aliens, other, other planets, and what what was being created across the world? What was being created in the UK? What was being created in Japan? I wanted to see all of it. I wanted to see, even though Star Wars was a, a major inspiration for people across the world, it was how they absorbed that, how they absorbed what they saw on the screen and what they wanted to churn out. So there I am, a young wee lad, and I'm itching for some more sci-fi. So I go down to the local library and I asked the lady behind the desk, y'all got any more of that sci-fi? And she says, why sure. We do have uh, some sci-fi art books you might be interested in. So I march over to the little sci-fi art book collection that they have. And one book in particular stood out to me. And it still does to this day. Uh, Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials. This book was like a Bible to me. I would check this book out nearly every week and I would scour through every little bit of line work, every detail of this book. And it's Wayne Barlow's way of illustrating and showing sort of a um, biological journal of classic sci-fi characters that we've never seen before, creatures. And um, it's, it's his interpretation of what these things might look like. So this particular book, I took to school every day on the bus, brought it home, looked at it, go back to the library, check it back out, and out of all the, the sci-fi books and all the different visits I would take to the library, I started noticing that other kids were checking them out, which is great. 
spread the word, you know, definitely. Uh, but I started noticing that these little shit kids started drawing ding-dongs and boobies on all the robots. Well, I couldn't have any of that. So I took it upon myself to rescue my favorite books. And this is the actual book that I checked out, checked out, from the library. And um, I'm glad I did because this is the 1979 first edition of Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials. And I've been such a fan of Wayne Barlow's art over the years that I've also followed and picked up many more of his uh, books. Barlow's Guide to Fantasy, his expedition book, More Aliens. There's a TV special on this, so check it out. The Alien Life of Wayne Barlow, which this led into his darker Barlow's Inferno, sort of his guidebook of a uh, pilgrimage through hell, like a National Geographic special of demons. And I was so impressed with this that I've also picked up his Brushfire portfolio. And not long or around the same time that this was released, they announced that they were going to release a special limited edition bust of one of the main characters, the Curian here, which, of course, I had to pick up. So they only made about 500 of these, and um, I absolutely love him. So one great thing about discovering Wayne Barlow when I did was sometime in the mid-'80s, I'd already been collecting toys for a while, and one day I go to Toys R Us, and there on the shelf is a brand new action figure line. I've never seen them before, but I was able to recognize the designs. And that line was Power Lords. Wayne Barlow's name wasn't on the packaging as far as I can remember, but I definitely knew it was his work. And I collected that toy line, and maybe a couple years go by, and then they finally discontinued it. They're, they only made a few pieces. But luckily, a few years ago, Four Horsemen Studios had acquired the license, and they were able to continue the toy line. So since then, I had been picking up a few of theirs, which is great because it's in my favorite scale of 1 18th scale. So I love these. And the blue one's great because it actually is signed by Wayne Barlow and uh, I believe some of the sculptors at Four Horsemen. So more of the books that I collected as a kid, the Encyclopedia of Sci-Fi, and then the Pictorial History of Science Fiction, which is great because this came out before Star Wars was released. So before Star Wars became the cool kid on the block, this kind of delves into a lot of the more classic stuff. So with all the new sci-fi art I was discovering at the time, I also came across fantasy art. And this one was a huge inspiration for me as a kid, the Gnomes book. And it's basically like a field guide for actual gnomes. How they live, what do they do, where do they poop, what do they eat, all of that. And this is my childhood copy. It, it says... Chris Shaler on there because I was taking it to school every day and I did not want um, kids to draw dicks and boobies on the gnomes. Well, not long after the gnomes book was released, they did come out with the gnomes pop-up book. And this is my childhood copy. I love this. And it's got all the same artwork from the original book. But one thing great about this, and this is what sparked something inside me, that with pop-up books, you know, the pages, you can open them up and kind of see some of the magic behind the curtain of how they put them together, the different tabs and things like that. Well, this one, I opened it up one day and noticed the Starship Enterprise. Now, I know it's just the publishing company. They needed some scrap paper to reinforce areas of the page, uh, to hold down some of the tabs, whatever. But it led me to believe that maybe there's a possibility that you could have 
two completely different genres of sci-fi and fantasy, and what if you put them together? What if they could coexist within the same world? So you take some elements of this and some elements of that, and maybe a few elements of this over here and something down here, and you take all that and mishmash it together, now what do you have? I don't know, this, I guess. So not long after discovering a starship in Gnomeland, around that period of time I started collecting comics. And I was collecting the mainstream stuff of Marvel and DC, some independent titles. I'm a huge fan of, uh, of Grendel from Comico. And I was collecting international comics. Comics from Japan with manga. And I really got into French comics. And of course the the main name that pops up when you're talking about French comics is Mobius. Now this guy is probably responsible for inspiring several thousand franchises now. Uh, this particular story, The Long Tomorrow, is pretty much the main seed that created Blade Runner. And if you read this comic, you will realize that it is essentially a retelling or Blade Runner is a retelling of this story. So if you were ever looking for inspiration to be able to create your own sci-fi city with whatever style you want to, you really need to check out his work just to get an idea, a grasp of, of to what scale you really can build at. It doesn't have to be something urban. It could be desert. It could be some sort of alien ruins. Even his Western work is inspiring. But this man is a, a treasure of ideas. And if you do like Westerns, the Dime Novel Legends figure line has you know, recently been released. You need to look into Mobius's Western work of Blueberry. So when I mentioned that I collected comics and manga, I'm a big collector of anime, and I love seeing how, especially if you go back to Blade Runner, how eventually the look of that, elements of that, popped up in Ghost in the Shell. Um, one title that I fell in love with, I was collecting and re reading religiously, was Battle Angel Alita. That's how, what it was known here in the States. And when the movie was finally released just recently, I absolutely loved it. I love the detail work in it. I love the city that's in it. And being able to see something on the screen that reminds me so much of what I created here in this playroom, uh, it's, it's a great feeling knowing that I can watch something at a movie and then drive back home and I can play with it here. And of course, I don't even really need to say much about this, but get it. Get it. And I will say that when I was designing Rock Gut Station, and I really wasn't sure about what kind of color palette I wanted to give it, I was seriously thinking about something very drab, gray, almost imperialistic, um, maybe like a, a, a slummy imperial city. But something about, something screamed at me, you need to add color. So, something kept nagging at me, add color, trust me, add color. I don't know who that was talking, but... I will say that Chris Foss's work was hugely inspirational for doing this, with, with creating these structures in so many varieties of colors and patterns and trusting that it was all going to fit and all look right. And this guy's spaceship designs are something that definitely inspired me with going the extra mile and just having fun with it, going crazy with it. Just see what happens. I'm not going to be able to mess it up. Just go for it. So uh, his work was a huge kick in the ass for me. Check out his spaceship designs. You've seen them before, I'm sure. His stuff is, is a classic. And being able to put tiger stripes and, and caution stripes and uh, modeled colors and you name it, he's had a ship in some sort of color or pattern. Something that you wouldn't imagine, but... They're bumpy, they're herky-jerky, they're not your typical clean, sleek, sexy ships. These things are gritty and ugly, and I love them. I love them. 
So this, th these are the type of ships that I was imagining flying around the airspace of Rodgut Station. And I don't know why I keep pointing at it, because it's right here. It's pretty obvious, but uh, just bear with me. And as much of a Star Wars fan as I am, I can honestly say I'm in love with Star Trek. I love its designs, especially the con conceptual designs that are in here, things that could have been. And um, you have to check out these works. It, it's, it, it's incredible to see so many different artistic interpretations of which direction that the storyline could go. And it should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. If Mobius was the seed for Blade Runner, that Sid Mead was the absolute reason Blade Runner looks the way it does. So let's say that you're itching to create some sort of diorama, a playset, a big-ass city, but you need something to motivate you. You need something to spark that creativity to start, something to do. You need to marinate your mind with this artwork, with Sid Mead, with Mobius, and definitely check out Wayne Barlow. So, next question, is there a backstory to Rock Gut Station? There is. It is a bit of a loose narrative that I kind of make up as I go, um, but from what I imagine of Rock Gut is that it used to be a mining platform, something that was mounted inside the hollow core of an asteroid. And maybe the corporation abandoned it, hundreds of years go by, and eventually these squatters and pirates and smugglers and overall lowlifes have taken it over. And they've developed it into a community, and then it eventually grew into an actual fully functional city. So at the hollow core of this asteroid, the interior cavern walls have been skinned over with metal plating, and panels, and billboards, and neon signs, and all of that sort of traps in the atmosphere. All of that is a protective inner coating. So I imagine with this giant asteroid, there's a series of docking ports that are all along the exterior of it. So when a ship is approaching, they're given clearance, and they go to their assigned docking portal. Once they enter, there's a series of tunnels, a web work of these chambers, that allows them to go through, and these are segmented so that portions of it can be uh, locked off, ships can be trapped inside if they need to be, if they haven't paid their docking fees, and all of that leads to the interior. These tunnels are small enough that it allows only smaller vessels to be able to enter. That prevents any kind of large capital ships, military vessels, from being able to enter and taking over the whole city. And Rodgut receives travelers and space traffic from every known and unknown universe. I imagine that this asteroid is surrounded by a cluster of wormholes. So these are portals that lead to other realities, other, other franchises essentially. Star Wars, Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, you name it. These things, these are visitors from these areas. So Rocket is sort of a way station, a, a what-if truck stop that's at the butthole of the galaxy. So then I'm asked, well, how is this even possible? How is it that these beings from all these different universes, different realities, different timelines, how can they all live in one spot without affecting their own universe when they go back? And I'd like to think that all of the little hidden Easter eggs that you've seen in movies, the little trinkets that you might see, little tiny props that's on a shelf, in the background that's just a production nod towards something else, what if there's actually some area, a dark area, of side space? What if these little things aren't necessarily just little production Easter eggs, but what if there's actually a whole backstory of people that are smuggling these things through? And maybe Rotka is that sort of intermediary, the 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 place you go to fuel up and repair before you go to your destination or back home. So I like to think that Rotgut could be a possible reason why you have something like the EVA pod from 2001 sitting in Watto's junkyard in The Phantom Menace, or the reason why you have 
Han and Carbonite figurines that are hidden in the background of most episodes of Firefly. Or you have the Starlight Intruder from Star Wars show up in an episode of Firefly. Or Firefly shows up in an episode of Battlestar Galactica. There's so many different little possibilities that you could have of a storyline to make all of that make sense. So Rocket Station is this roadside attraction along this black market trade route. It's the uh, south of the border of space. And a lot of the inhabitants and the ships and the buildings and the tech are all a patchwork of bits and pieces from these different realities, these different universes. And they're able to smuggle them here, repair them, swap them, trade them, sell them, whichever, and make it all work. So I even created a custom character of myself that lives here at the station. And he's got an assortment of gear from all these different universes. He's got a modified Mandalorian helmet. His sidearm is the gong pistol from the Appleseed anime. He's got a rifle that's the mare's leg from Firefly. He keeps it in a back sheath that's uh, from Ash from Army of Darkness. And he's got a wrist-mounted rocket launcher from G.I. Joe. And his personal ship is a modified YT-1300 freighter that he's modified with a piggybacked Harvester Attacker from Independence Day. So I know a lot of sci-fi purists, they don't like to mix up their, their sci-fi. They don't like their food to touch. They, they like their peas over here, their carrots over here, Ewoks there, and Klingons here. And I'm not like that. I like my sci-fi like it's a Golden Corral buffet. I like it all spread out, and I like to pick and choose the elements that I enjoy and then pile all that shit on my plate. So there's so many elements and facets of sci-fi that I like that I don't want to keep it compartmentalized. I like to take all of it and try to put it together and make something that's unbelievably believable. And I'd like to believe that if you can't control the real world, then why not just create your own? Thanks again for watching. And be sure to watch the next episode coming soon. And be sure to also follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Empire Toy Works.